you've ever needed an attorney. Anybody ever need an attorney? Well, I've got one right now. I'm just facing a lawsuit. I, I'm just wishing these guys would practice in California. <laughs> Could I just bring you out there? What we want to do right now is say, you know, you're thinking Esther, such a time as this. And the story that you told about how you got to where you are. We're going to thank God for that. But right now, we're going to all reach our hands out and send a blessing to this law firm, to these two men, to the position that they hold in the community, in the kingdom of God, and for the kingly role that they're walking in. Join me right now as we send a blessing. Father, we pray right now that the blessing of the Holy Spirit would come right now to fill and to inspire and to creatively speak the message that you have right now. We thank you, Lord, for Larry. We thank you for Mike. We thank you for the firm that they represent. And Father, right now, we release the anointing of the Lord. We release the anointing. I join with Pastor right now to release the anointing of the Lord, that there would be more empowering from the Holy Spirit, more words that are spoken, more outpouring of your life, Holy God, as we anoint the kings right now to take their place in this marketplace. And Father, we declare today, we stand with you as kings and priests. We stand together. You have come alongside Pastor, so he didn't stand alone. And we come alongside you, so you don't stand alone. Be blessed in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, needless to say, Words just can't express how much I love these men. My, uh, Larry Morris is like a brother to me. He's, I never had a brother, but he's just like a brother to me. And God had him at the right place at the right time. And my, his counsel was so solid. And, but not only his counsel, but it was his compassion that was able to minister to me, you know. Um, when a pastor's going through hell like that, sometimes you kind of lose bearings. It's like you're blindfolded and you're being spun around and around. You don't even know where you're at. But he was always there as an anchor, and as a solid rock. And at times when I felt like things were just swirling out of control, I could hear his voice and it would bring some stability. And Mike Papantonio, of course, is a man that uh, most people in this room don't even realize the magnitude of the lawyer that he really is, but he is not just an awesome lawyer, but we have found him to be an awesome friend. And their contributions to our school and to us personally, you know, as, as friends, just their friendship means more than I can ever say. So I just want to say one more time to these men, we love you and God bless you. Thank you so much. Hallelujah. Well, we are right on time. It's amazing. If this was a pastor's conference, we'd be way off. <laughs> but pastor, I know you have to leave to go to funeral at some point, so we allow you to go. There's no problem. And um, we're going to introduce our next speaker to you, and he's give you a short exhortation. And I'll introduce him in a second. But before you leave this afternoon, we have uh, Brother Rich Marshall is again is going to share a very powerful finale word for you this afternoon and then tonight our grand grand finale where pastor will be back mr david green from hobby lobby will be here we'll have an anointing service we're going to have a very powerful drama uh, from our students all the students are going to be involved we're going to be laying on hands and praying for you we are so excited about what god is going to do tonight amen are you excited yeah. hallelujah well right now we'd like to introduce to you our president of the brownsville revival school of ministry and my personal friend, Richard Crisco. Would you make him welcome? Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Am I on? There we go. Good. Um, is, can we get my PowerPoint on the screen? If not, Jody can come help me get this up there for me. You should have gotten uh, an outline of my lesson, message, whatever you want to call it, when you came in. It's... Um, it's a little half page folded. If you did not get that, if you'll raise your hand, the ushers will run that to you. Ushers, if you'll move as quickly as possible. As we uh, shift gears a little bit, um, I want to share with you a little pragmatics to be able to take back with you. 
You know, this conference, I don't know about you, but it has been uh, so inspirational for me and has helped me to stretch my theology a little bit. It's uh, inspired me. And um, one of the things that I'm probably best at is trying to be a little pragmatic. I, uh, there's nobody that loves the moving of the Spirit more than I do. But uh, I've been to a lot of conferences where I get real inspired, but then I go home and I go, well, what do I do? <laughs> and um, I'm, I'm going to hopefully share with you a tool that you probably know, but you probably need to be reminded of. You know, so many times in Scripture, you'll see where the writer will say, let me remind you, or I bring to your remembrance, or let me refresh you. And um, one of the things as leaders and as businessmen that we have to constantly do is we have to have the ability of lifting people's morale. And um, if the people's morale is not strong, then our businesses, our ministries are not healthy. And um, I'm a very simple man, but the Lord has gifted me in the area of being able to lift people's spirits. I know it's a gifting of mine. Whenever I came to the Brownsville Revival School of Ministry, I came as a result of a split that had come to the church, had come to the school, and I was just the youth pastor here. And pastor asked me, he said, Richard, can I get you to become the interim president of the school? And uh, it was a very painful situation that I won't go into details over, but the Lord has brought complete reconciliation among all parties since then. Thank you, Jesus. But I remember when I went over there, I went over there with two goals. I said, Lord, I have two goals in mind. I said, number one, I want to bring healing to a very painful situation. And number two, I want to keep a pure heart doing it all. And with the grace of the Lord, the Lord has helped me to do that, and I thank him for that. But um, <clears throat> having said that, let's just pray, and then I want to just share very briefly with you some principles on how to lift the morale of the people that you minister to and are over. Father, I just ask for your anointing. I thank you, Lord, once again for what you're doing in this place. I ask that in the next 20, 30 minutes that you would give us some practicums that we could take home. Remind us, Lord, of how we can establish the atmosphere of our businesses and our cities, Lord. Lord, let us be thermostats that can set the standards, Lord, for those that we're with. And I'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Everybody said... Amen. We need to realize that as leaders, we, like thermostats, not only measure the temperature, but we actually set the temperature. And you know, the, really the only difference between a thermostat and a thermometer, in fact, a thermostat is nothing more than a thermometer until it gets hooked up to a power source. But then a thermostat's still no good unless you know how to use it. Trust me, talk to my wife. I came home yesterday, and she's wearing three outfits. I mean, she's freezing. And I said, baby, what's the matter? She goes, I'm freezing. I'm cold in here. I said, turn up the thermostat. I don't know how. And I'm sitting there going, I've been married for 19 years. I still haven't taught her how to use the thermostat. But as leaders, as businessmen and women, we have that ability, and we have the responsibility of setting the temperature and the tone for those that we're with. And so let me just give you an acrostic very quickly from morale. And M is model. If you want to raise the morale of your people, you've got to model that atmosphere for them. Paul said this in Philippians 4.9. He said, whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put into practice and the God of peace will be with you. I've said for years to those that I have been over you can go anywhere I go, say anything I say, do anything I do, and I promise you, you will never bring a reproach to Christ or this church. That's not to say that I'm perfect, friend. I mean, I'll be the very first one whenever I blow it to fall down on my knees before you and ask you to forgive me. But I've learned this, that, that maybe I'm not the greatest speaker in the world, I'm not the most brilliant person in the world, but I can be a man of God that can set the tone and the atmosphere. And I do know this, that you teach what you know, but you what, BRSM? Reproduce who you are. Reproduce who you are. 
You teach what you know, but you reproduce who you are. If you want to know who I am, don't go by pulpit ministry. Because I'm just like every other public speaker. I know how to do it. But if you know what, want to know who I am, hang around with the people that I am over. Hang around with BRSM students. Hang around with the staff at BRSM. Because your people reflect who you are. Sir, if you have a business and, and it's, it's all the time and you got grumbling and complaining in your staff, you probably need, need to check up on your own countenance. Hello, making friends. <laughs> because John, listen, John 3, 6 says this, that, that, that flesh gives birth to flesh, but spirit gives birth to spirit. Hello. See, John Maxwell is my hero. I bleed John Maxwell. I've read every book, listened to every tape that the man has ever put out. And he says this, that 89% of what people learn comes from visual stimulation. 1%, 10% comes from audio stimulation, and 1% come from other senses. So it makes sense that the more followers see and hear their leaders being consistent in actions and words, the greater their consistency and loyalty. What they hear, they understand. What they see, they believe. And so what we need is we need more models for them to see than we do mottos for them to say. We need to have a mission statement. But more than a mission statement, they need a missions standard. Because you can have a mission statement for your business, but if you're not living it out, they're not going to live it out. And they're going to be just like you are. And you can, listen, I... Are you the type of boss that when you walk into your place of business, everybody begins to get on pins and needles and nervous? And they're glad when you leave so they can then function properly? Hello, making friends. Or are you the type of boss that when everything's going crazy and you walk in the door, everybody goes, hallelujah, the man or the woman is here. We can relax now. There's peace. There's harmony. There's safety. We're going to make it now because they're here. What atmosphere do you set? So in raising morale, M is morale. O stands for ownership. If you want to raise the morale of your people, you need to give them as much ownership as possible because it's a proven fact in your notes that people get much more excited about something when they feel like it belongs to them. That's a well-known fact. I've said, to you, I said for years to youth pastors across this nation, the reason why young people are bored with their youth services is that because they belong to the youth pastor instead of the young people. And the youth pastor stands up and he says, Now you tell everybody to come next week and watch me perform. And it works the same way in your business. If you want your people's morale to jump, give them ownership in whatever way you can do that. In your notes, if people have an active part, they will become more faithful and excited about their job unless... We have placed them in a position that does not challenge them or utilize their gifts. R for morale is recognize and reward. If you want to raise the morale of your people, if you want to raise the morale of your organization, you need to recognize and reward. Because when you fail to recognize their efforts, when you fail to recognize their accomplishments, they begin to lose heart and they will eventually stop trying to excel. Always, always give credit to whom credit is due. Romans 13, 7 says, give everyone what you owe him. If taxes, taxes, revenue, revenue, respect, respect, honor, give them honor. A, in morale, is give them an adventure. You realize the scripture in numerous places refers to us as pilgrims? Hebrews 11.13 calls us strangers and pilgrims. 1 Peter 2.11 in your notes says, Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. And a pilgrim, by definition, is a crusader. They're a traveler and a crusader. People are all the time needing a new territory to conquer. Some of you have had some employees that have worked for you and they were outstanding employees for a year or two and then they seem to lose interest. They seem to 
to lose morale. They seem to lose a drive. They begin to come in late. They begin to kind of slack up. You know what? They're probably, it's not, they're a great employee. They've already proved that. You know what they need? They need a new territory to conquer. They need a new mountain to conquer. They need something new. You got to challenge them because there's a, there's a conqueror inside all of us. We were created in the image of God. And Romans 8.37 describes him. It says that we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. I read an article entitled The Mundane Man. It goes like this. It says the mundane man, as I view it, is the man who believes in only what he sees, only what is imitate, uh, immediate, only what he can put his hands on. He may be a truck driver, or a banker, or a college president, a clerk, or a junk dealer. The occupation does not matter. The mundane man lacks depth, and he lacks vision. The poorest of all men is not the one without a nickel to his name, but it is the fellow without a dream. The mundane man resembles a great ship made for the mighty oceans, but tries to navigate in a mill pond. He has no far port to reach, no lifting, hori lifting horizon, no precious cargo to carry. His hours are absorbed in routine and petty tyrannies. Small wonders if he gets dissatisfied, quarrelsome, and fed up. One of life's greatest tragedies is for a person with a 10 by 12 capacity and a 2 by 4 soul. Employees. Employees need to grow. If you asked, you probably have learned that many employees are thrilled at the thought of coming to work if learning is a part of their daily experience. Research confirms this is a case. Training, professional development, opportunities to try new skills or applying existing skills in new ways and cross-training are mutually beneficial business tools. The organization deepens its bank of knowledge and know-how, and the employees' morale soars as they grow. A, give them adventure. L is listen. Beside that, if you want to put in there love, because to me, one of the greatest ways to love somebody is listen to them. Listen, boss. Listen, employer. Hear their voice. Welcome and provide venues for employee feedback and, and, and participation and take appropriate actions to consider and respond to their comments. When people don't feel heard or perceive that their leader, uh, that their ideas aren't valued or at least acknowledged, morale suffers. Woodrow Wilson said, the ear of the leader must ring with the voice of the people. The ear of the leader must ring with the voice of the people. And let me remind you, just a couple, by no means exhaustive, but just let me remind you, businessman, businesswoman, let me remind you of the benefits that we can reap by listening. Number one, listening shows and builds respect. You go, well, hey, they're supposed to respect me. Let me tell you, let me remind you, whatsoever you sow is what you reap. One of the reasons why I'm so effective with teenagers is because I'm one of the few adults that will listen to them. And I respect teenagers. Even when I disagree with them, I respect them. And, that, and therefore, because I respect them, they turn around and respect me. When we take time to listen to those that are under us and with us, it communicates to them that they are valuable and we respect them. Number two benefit is listening increases knowledge. Listen, I love what Lindell um, Johnson had on his office door. He said, you ain't learning nothing when you're doing all the talking. <laughs> One common problem as people gain more authority is that they often listen to others less and less, especially the people who report to them. While it's true that the higher you go, the less you are required to listen to others, it's also true that you need good listening skills even more. The farther you get from the front lines, the more you have to depend on others to get reliable information. Only if you develop good listening skills early and then continue to use them will you be able to gather the information that you need to be successful. 
Listening also builds loyalty. Everyone loves a good listener and is attracted to him or her who will listen to them. And if you will consistently listen to others, they will likely develop a strong loyalty to you. Listen. Love your people. And E, and I want to spend the rest of my time on E, because this is the crutch of my message, and that is encourage. Encourage. Make praise a part of your leadership planning. While it's not the magic bean, effective praise is one required element of any business that wants to reproduce the employee related uh, uh, re reduce the employee related stresses and strains that are inherited in the business owner's world. Why? Because people need and like constructive feedback. And even if they say they don't, feedback helps individuals get clear ideas of what is expected. When done correctly and mindfully, praise helps communicate what is expected of the employees and increases an employee's commitment to his or her growth and motivation to do the job well. It can also help you focus on what skills, attitudes, and actions you want taken in the root of your company culture. It also puts a spotlight on what traits you want to emulate and demonstrate yourself. Listen, businessmen and women, learning to give praise accomplishes several objectives. It's a great way to improve dialogue between you and your employees, and it rewards behavior that you want to reproduce. From an employee's perspective, praise is motivating because it feels good to hear it and how he or she is hitting the mark. And human nature being what it is, everybody wants to know they're doing good. William James said the deepest principle in human nature is the craving to be appreciated. You're looking at a man I never worked for money, never did. Even, even my very first job, yes, I worked for money, but what I'm saying is this, I got more great, I got more jollies <laughs> when my boss came to me and said, son, your aisle looks awesome in our store. That meant more to me than that paycheck that I received on Tuesday evening. Hans Frenzel said this, organizational researchers have been telling us for years that affirmation motivates people much more than financial incentives, but we still don't get it. Trust me, you're looking at a preacher. I've got to get people to do things for me all the time, and I don't pay them. In fact, I make them pay me. I say, you got to pay your tithes to work for me. <laughs> Money is not your answer. But I want to remind you that there's a power in praise that brings hope, strength, and significance to an individual that releases God's potential in them to supersede their natural abilities. How many parents do I have in the house? Parents? Almost everybody here, except for a few BRSM students that aren't married yet and they're dreaming of that day. <laughs> Remember when your children were getting around 10, 11, 12 months old, and little Johnny decided that he wanted to start getting around the house a little bit quicker, and so he pulls himself up on the, on the furniture. And I remember that very first time he pulls himself up on the coffee table. Friend, you break out cameras, you break out video cameras, you know. You start calling mom and dad, you get the neighbors, you bring the whole church over. Look, Johnny stood up! And he's standing there wobbling around, you know. And, 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 and remember, just a short period of time later, you know, you got mama and she's holding Johnny and, and daddy's just a couple of you know, feet away and, and little Johnny's staggering, you know, and mama go, go to daddy. And daddy's over, come on, bud, come on, Johnny. And Johnny, he's, hey, mama lets go and he's kind of, <laughs> you know, and, and he takes one step and, and everybody, ah! 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 you got the videos going, ah! You're screaming, you're clapping, and Johnny gets excited. And next thing you know, he falls right on his big poof. <laughs> you don't go at that moment. You dumb kid. You are supposed to walk to daddy. <laughs> you don't do that. What do you do? You go, ah! And you pick him up again. Come on, Johnny! We have forgotten the power of praise that is released 
months old and we freely gave it to him for everything. Now he's 13 years old and we blast him for everything. We forget the power of praise in the workplace that will motivate, lift the morale, and cause your people to go beyond their paycheck. And there's a power that is released in praise. And I want to share just a couple of things very quickly. Oh, Jesus, stop the clock. Okay. Everybody, stop the clock. Okay. Number one. Praise releases strength. Jot it down. Praise releases strength. Uh, look in your notes at Matthew, Matthew 3.17. You'll see that you'll recognize this account very quickly. And a voice from heaven said, This is my son whom I love, and with him I am well pleased. And then Jesus was led by the Spirit in the desert to be tempted by the devil. Now, I want you to, I want you to understand what's happening here. This is where you recognize it. This is where Jesus is being baptized by John the Baptist. You know the story. Behold, the, son of, uh, the Lamb of God takes away the sins of the world. And, and, you know, Jesus says, baptize me. And Jesus comes up out of the water. And all of a sudden, the heavens open. And God begins to brag on Jesus. He says, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. And my American mind is going, No! God, you can't be pleased with Jesus yet. He hasn't done anything. His ministry had not started yet. He had not, pre he had not preached one sermon. He had not opened one dead blinded eye. He had not raised anybody from the dead. How could he say he's pleased with him? Because, see, we are trained that we have to earn people's approval. We are trained that we have to earn people's pleasure. And there's two things that the Lord showed me that he said, Richard, you need to understand because I'm all the time trying to earn God's favor. Listen to me. He said, Richard, you need to understand. I love Jesus just because of who he was, not what he did. He loves you just because of who you are, not because of what you do. But I want you to catch this. There's a second part of this that the Lord showed me, and that was this. The Lord knew that Jesus was about to go into the desert, I read it for you, to be tempted by the devil for 40 days and 40 nights. And the Lord just wanted to give Jesus a little extra booster. And he says, my son in whom I'm well pleased. And I can imagine, Frank, because I know what it's like to crave my father's pleasure. And to bring my father pleasure. And I can imagine for the next 40 days as Jesus is going through temptation, he's rehearsing in his head over and over again, my father is well pleased with me. My father is well pleased. And it gave him that strength to endure. When you praise people, it gives them strength to do that which they were supposed to accomplish. The second thing it does is it releases potential. Never forget that people live up to or down to your expectations. Speak life into people. Be a life speaker in your business place. When you walk in, you should be speaking life and people will live up to your expectations. I cannot tell you how many dozens of teenagers through the years whose parents have brought them and threw them in my office door saying, I can't do anything else with this kid. This kid is over with. And I'll speak to that that young man or that young woman, and I'll just love on him for 30 minutes. I'll speak life into him for an hour. I'll show him I believe in him. I tell him I don't believe there's such a thing as a bad kid, only bad situations that have polluted them. And I'll begin to speak life into them, and they begin to blossom right before my eyes. It releases also confidence. Encourage, by definition, is to inspire with hope, courage, or confidence. You know, whenever, uh, right now, the basketball season's coming to an end. It's only got, you know, about another week or so. And the big talk right now is, you know, who's winning, who's winning, and who's going to be in the playoffs. And everybody wants to have the best winning record going into the playoffs. And why do they want to have the best winning record, congregation? They want home field advantage. Why do they want home field advantage? Because they want everybody around them to be rooting for them, not against them. And there is a strength in that environment. There's a confidence when everybody is shouting you for you and it's behind you. There's a confidence that causes you to rise up and do that which you normally would never feel like you can do. I am all the time tackling.
fulfilling task that I don't feel like I am quite good enough for, including this message right now. Being talking to businessmen and women scares me spitless, friend. You notice I haven't drank any water yet. But whenever my pastor sticks his finger in my face and he says, you can do this, you are called to do this, you can do this, friend, there's a confidence that rises inside of me. And I go, come on, bring it on. <laughs> we need to speak confidence in life into them. Number four is it, it releases loyalty. Let me tell you one thing I've learned about people, and that's this. People love to hear their praises. And they are drawn to those who will sing them. Isn't that the truth? You don't believe me? Try it out on your teenager at home. You tell them that they're a scum bucket, and I guarantee they'll find them a drug addict who will tell them they're the awesome, most awesome kid that walked on the planet. And guess who they'll be drawn to? They'll become a homosexual just to get that guy's affirmation. It'll create loyalty. You're all the time worried about your employees turning on you and not being loyal. Let me tell you something. You praise your employees. You encourage them. Let me tell you something. They'll be your best supporter. Number five, and this one's the one that cranks my tractor, friend. Number five is praise releases God's presence. We quote a scripture in church all the time. It's Psalms 22, verse 3. It say, and it says this, But thou art holy, O thou that inhabits the praises of Israel. And we always interpret that as being, you know, when we worship, God inhabits the worship. Ooh, he interprets the praise. I mean, he inhabits the praise, blah, blah. Let me tell you what. I believe it means much more than that. It does not say that God inhabits the praises to him. It doesn't say that God inhabits praises in the church. Or worship praises. It says God inhabits praises. And I believe, and I've taught teenagers this for years. When I've told teenagers, teenagers, if you've got a problem with mom and dad, don't back, back talk them. Don't bad mouth them and give the devil an opportunity to come in with confusion and disrupt your home. I said, start singing their praises. Because when you begin to sing people's praises, God rides and inhabits the wave of praises and is released into that person's life. I wish I had more time. Shababako. Listen to me. God inhabits praises. I knew I was going to run out of time, so what I did was I gave you some tips to spreading effective praise in your organization. I'm not going to insult your intelligence. I hope that you are earnest enough that you will look at these, these tips that I have typed out for you because I knew I was going to run out of time, so come to the bottom of it after, after number six. Listen to me. The more that we can praise people for the things that they do right, the less we will have to discipline for the things that they do wrong. I believe that, friend. And a little bit of praise can go a long ways, but it shouldn't have to. I love what Phyllis Thoreau said in your notes. She said, one of the accommodations in life that most people can, cannot get enough of is compliments. The ego is never so intact that one can't find a hole in which to plug a little praise. But compliments, by their very nature, are highly biodegradable and tend to dissolve hours or days after we receive them, which is why we can always use another one. I say amen. amen. The scripture says, and I close in 1 Thessalonians 4, 5, 14, and we urge you, brothers, warn those who are idle, encourage the timid, help the weak, be patient with everyone. Lifting morale, here's how you do it, businessmen and women. Here's how you do it. You model it for them. You model the atmosphere. You model the behavior. You model the attitude that you want your people to have. Give them ownership. Let them be a part. And in whatever way that you can create, let them be a part of the plan. Or reward them. Recognize and reward them for the things that they do well. A, give them new adventures. Give them new mountains to conquer. L, listen to them, love them, care for them. If they really believe that, they, that you care about them, friend, they'll give their life for you. They'll give their life for you. And E, encourage them. Give them praise. Give them praise. Thank you. God bless you.
That's our president, Richard Crisco. Amen. Wonderful. I think every business in town should hear that message. Hallelujah. You may be seated. Thank you. I'm going to introduce our final speaker today uh, in a moment, Brother Rich Marshall. And um, he's going to be sharp and crisp. We want you to give your best ear to him. But before we do that, I heard a rumor. I don't know if there's any truth to this rumor. But I heard a rumor that Mr. and Mrs. David Green might be with us here in this audience today. Is that true? Are you here, Mr. Green? Could you stand for so we can welcome you? Thank you so much for being here and your wife. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. We had no idea that you snuck in on us. We are so grateful for you guys coming here. And uh, we are just so looking forward to tonight. And would you just greet everyone? And Thank you. Well, we're glad to be here. And uh, glad to be able to attend this afternoon service. So we kind of have a little flavor of uh, what this business meeting about. But uh, we're, we're happy to be here. It's not something we normally do is get up and speak. I would have felt much better if you'd asked me to put a booth out here and put some beads and sequins and maybe some macrame in there. But uh, we'll do, well, we're here to uh, let you know how, God, how good God is in our life. Thank you so much. I want you all to know that my wife only shops at Hobby Lobby since you decided to come here, okay? <laughs> Thank you. Praise the Lord. Are you happy today? Yes. Amen. Are you excited about tonight? Yes. Amen. We have some seats for you here, friends. Hallelujah. Brother Rich, are you ready? Come on, man. Give Brother Rich a warm, warm applause. It's been a joy for my wife and I to be here uh, this week. I hope that some of you have received some things that will be life-changing for you. I will tell you right now that we have. There's been an impact that's come into our life. Just, you know, the things that you don't expect that will just slam you upside the head. And sometimes you just have to say, this is it. Hallelujah. But uh, for Wilma and I, it's a joy to be here. I always love to have my wife with me. I travel uh, well this year. It seems like every week of the year. She doesn't always get to be with me. To, sure makes my life better when she's here. So I uh, just want to honor my sweetie and thank you for uh, being here. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Oftentimes, she, she's not real comfortable if we put her on as a speaker. But every once in a while, she'll get something. And uh, so if, every once in a while, I just look at her and see if she's ready. Because uh, I remember I did a seven-hour conference in Australia one day, and she spoke seven minutes in the middle of it. And at the end of the conference, just kind of standing there, I looked over and she had a line of people waiting to speak to her. And I was just kind of standing there. Pretty soon a guy came up to me and I said, praise God. I said, can I help you? He said, yeah, can you get me in your wife's line? And it's like, <laughs> so, uh, honey, you want to greet the folks? Yeah, all right. Okay. I can always greet. Listening to what's been said here today, there's more words than we can, I think we can even comprehend. But I remember one time in prayer, the Lord said to me, my people know how to do. They don't know how to be. Being is occupying space. When Jesus came, he said, mother, did you not know that I must be about my father's business? He did nothing without looking to his father. Occupying space is being. To do is to perform. It's personal effort. Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? That's all I have to say. <laughs> God bless you. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. One of the things that's impacted us is the, uh, is the Brownsville Revival School of Ministry. Watching what God has done with this school has, uh, has touched me deep in my spirit. Because as I minister this word to marketplace people, can you see me if I'm down here or do I need to be up here to see me clear in the back? 
Is it all right? If uh, you don't need to see me anyway, it just doesn't really matter. It's just tune into the Lord. But we, we, we preach this message to marketplace people. I think this is the largest marketplace ministry gathering that we've had in America. I, I've been doing this since 1998, and, and, and not just me. I'm not just saying the largest that I've been a part of, but I think it's the largest that we've had just because it's starting to catch a hold. But we, we fight a major battle because there's a major shift in thinking that has to take place. And the thinking is taking place in this particular, in the business mind, quicker than the pastor's mind. In fact, I, I have a list in my Bible of pastors who've really grabbed a hold of this, captured it, and, have, and have, have incorporated it into their life. And my list is only eight churches long. Because, uh, and I, you know, I, that's not all-inclusive because I don't know all the pastors in the world. I may not know your pastor. I may not know you. I'm just saying of the places where I've been, that especially at the beginning, we'd have a conference and the pastor might invite me in. He'd introduce me. Then he would be gone. And I'd speak to the business people. And that was going on until about six or eight months ago when suddenly the pastor started sitting on the front row. And I don't know what happened. I think there's just a shift in the heavenly realm that says right now it's time for this to move to a higher level. And so when, when I first started doing this, there were others doing this before me. I'm by far not the, the, the beginner. But when I, when I started, it was, it was really like a voice crying in the wilderness. And then others started to come along. Because when I first started, I traveled with Ed Silvoso, Ed who's now with us. But Ed was was in the city transformation which he still is but he didn't have a concept yet of the marketplace ministry and, it, and in fact he, he would slide me into his three-day conference with a one-hour slot which would usually get shortened because that, that, well, it just wasn't yet the priority and then God got a hold of Ed, and hallelujah, it became a priority. You watch what God has done in his life. And the same has happened with, with uh, Peter Wagner. He's now focusing his attention there. And, and we were even at the Billy Graham Training Center last week, and Billy Graham has said, I believe that the next revival in America will come through the workplace. So it's elevating it. But when, when the Brownsville revival and the Brownsville School of Revival grabbed this thing, when men like Tommy Tinney, who already had it, and Matt Crouch, who told you today what's happened to him, and we began to put together this conference, I believe that at this time, we stepped over into the next phase. And, and what I began to see was that the battle that I've been struggling in communicating this, because I can, I can get to a marketplace person, they all tell me, this is confirmation of what God has been telling me. But we're not going to do it alone. Matt said it well. Without the king and the priest, without the pastor and the business person together. And what the Lord spoke to me today, Richard, is that in the next generation, if we can get the students now, we won't have to fight that battle the next time around. That we can, if we can change the mindset with the next generation of both pastors and business people, we won't have to fight it. You know, I speak a lot with groups like Full Gospel Businessmen and Businessmen's Fellowship. And, and when I speak there, uh, the truth is many of these men retired 10 years ago. And they say to me, wow, this is powerful. Why didn't I know this 30 years ago? And I'm saying the next generation, if we could just get this out now, we won't have to wait and battle through that. And what the Lord spoke to my wife and I was that we need to do whatever we can to pour into this student body. And uh, because I, I've been proclaiming and exciting people and getting you inspired and jumping out. And then I realized that it doesn't do a lot of good to inspire and release and encourage without equipping. So God led us into a whole new phase of equipping business people. And, uh, and now we've moved into that. And thank God I've got a model. I've got something that works. I've got something that's transferable. We've got something that's active. We've got something that's now working. We're doing it at local church levels. We're doing it in, in tech centers. We're finding it to be cross-culturally effective. This model that we have works. Uh, we've got them operating in Malaysia and in England and in uh, Holland and in Houston, and in San Jose, and in Seattle, and, and, and so we know this thing works in other cultures, and it works in the church, it works in the marketplace, and thank God that from my standpoint, I finally got something to take 
a business person beyond the excitement stage into some equipping. Because you see, I, I watched the, the marketplace prayer meetings. Thank God, I, I started, I think, 1,500 prayer meetings my first year out. I know of two of them that still exist. But I mean, these things hop and they, they flame and they go out. I, I look at Bible studies that meet at work, and I thank God when there's a Bible study in the marketplace. But most of them that I see are pretty anemic and are mostly Christians who are kind of huddled in their little corner, much like they did on Sunday in their church. And so I was looking for something that had the power to change the marketplace. And uh, we found it. We, we call it Kingdom Advice Centers. And a Kingdom Advice Center, in a, in a sentence, is a place where a marketplace person can come and learn how to hear the voice of God for their business. You see, we're not business consultants. We're trying to get you to learn how to hear the voice of God for your business because God can speak to you. You know, don't keep running to a consultant to have them tell you what to do. Run to God to have him tell you what to do. So what we do in the Kingdom Advice Center is simply train you in how to hear the voice of God in a marketplace setting, which, which means, by the way, we're not even calling it getting prophetic words. We're just saying learning how to hear the voice of God. And then focusing the voice of God into your life, where you are today. Because he cares about you where you are today. And uh, I know my screen was up here a minute ago, and I, I goofed with it too long. Oh, there, it's up there, but it's just not here. Okay, well. All right, one of the most powerful forces in the world today is this tremendous army. Did I lose it? There we go. It's, this tremendous army of governmental leaders who are anointed by God to serve him on a daily basis in their own sphere of influence. When we get this army released, folks, I tell you, it is like look out world. Because we've been battling with a, with a real small part of the armed force in the kingdom. And we've been doing it uh, because it was the only way we knew how to do it. But, you know, that our church services are much like an athletic event where all the people on the field are tired and worn out and all the people in the stadium need to get some exercise. And we've been doing that in the church. We've been, you know, we've been wearing out our pastors while the people are sitting there saying, what can I do? What can I do? And I tell you, when you go to a high-powered CEO and ask them, would you please serve in our parking lot crew? it may not be a huge challenge to them. And yet we think they're just not serving us in the church. What's going on? Why won't they serve us here? But when we, when we say to you, your business is your ministry, then everything changes. People ask me how I first got started in this, and I really don't know because I keep tracing it further back to prophetic words that came to me that I didn't know what they meant. I remember I was in Argentina, and, and uh, we were on our knees praying for revival for the city of Buenos Aires. And Suzette Hatting was preaching. Now Suzette Hatting at that time was the chief intercessor for Reinhard Bonnke ministry and Reinhard was coming to Argentina and she was there ahead of time to train the intercessors. And I was, my wife and I were sitting on the front row and the Spirit of God impacted us greatly. I mean, just changed our lives during that service. And I was on my knees praying and she walked up to me and laid her hand on my shoulder and said, Sir, are you a businessman? I said, No ma'am, I'm a pastor. She said, I must have heard it wrong. No, I'm sorry. God says that he is giving you a business that will take you around the world. And when he takes you, you won't have to worry about finances because God will take care of you. And he says, Isaiah 54, stretch your tent pegs wide. And on she goes with his word. And I heard that and I heard, I need to go start a business. I mean, I got home, my wife and I got home, we called our family together, we got Isaiah 54 out, we said, what are we going to do? We got two kids, they're both married, we're going to do a family business. And so, man, well, I mean, we started, and believing that travel was involved, thought I'd buy a travel agency. So we traveled all over San Jose to every travel agency that was for sale. We walked in there, all six of us, trying to find out, is this the right one? And I, I mean, we didn't know what questions to ask, because we didn't really care, we're just seeking God. So we kind of stand around in the travel agency praying and they'd say can we help you well uh 
Yeah, we thought maybe we'd take a trip. Where do you want to go? Oh, we'll go to that one. We just grab a brochure off. I mean, it was, everybody could see through it in a minute, you know. Nobody thought we really wanted to travel. And oh, I kind of laid that aside. And finally, I realized that her word to me had nothing to do with starting a business. Had to me had to do with what I'm doing now. God has given me a ministry to business people. Takes me around the world. We don't have to worry about finances because God provides. When we first started traveling, the Lord told me, he gave me a word. He's not retracted it yet. He said, ask for nothing, receive what you're given. So people say to me, what, do you, what does it cost to have you come? I say, just bring me. You ask God what to give me. Haven't yet put a price out there. Hope I never have to. Just the Lord said, you go, I'll take care of you. Now, at that time, our church believed in us and was supporting us. It's a congregation that we planted, and uh, so they, they heard this message and believed it needed to go to the world, so they sent us out, paid our salary. We put a young man in that I'd raised up in the ministry, and about uh, two or three years into that, started talking to him. I said, boy, things are changing. What's going on? He said, well, you know, we're not the same church we were. We've got a different vision now. I said, what do you mean a different vision? He said, we don't buy this marketplace stuff anymore. I knew something was happening. Last year they told us, they said, Rich, we're going to stop paying your salary. I said, well, you know, if you can't pay our salary, that's fine. God's my provider, not you. Amen. But they said, well, we also uh, want you to move out of the church building. I said, well, if you need my office, they don't need the office. The church is now 25% the size it was when we left. They changed vision, lost the people. So we want you out of the office. I said, that's no problem. Here's the keys. They said, well, we want an attorney to assure that you really leave. I said, don't worry, I'm going. They said, no, we're going to get an attorney to drop papers. So what is this? What's going on? I mean, if you don't have money to pay me, you sure don't have money to pay the attorney. I'll just leave. It's not a problem. No, I mean, it was just a mess. Painful. Hurting. So then, now we're traveling without salary, Amen. Guess what happens to the bank account at that point? It goes up, not down, folks. God is good. I mean, God takes care of things like this. Amen? I mean, he's, he's providing for us. But that's what Suzette Hatting said. It was going to happen. I just, nothing wrong with the prophetic word you get. There's just usually something wrong with your first interpretation. Let me tell you something. If God gives you a prophetic word that's so easy for you to figure out that you figured out in five minutes, you didn't need a prophetic word. I mean, if it's that easy to figure out, you already had the knowledge to know that stuff. If it's insight from God that you didn't have before, why don't you let it settle a while and see what it really means? That took us four or five years. In the middle of that, we were at a gathering, and uh, I got a word for our friend. Now, my wife and I have very good friends named Dennis and Megan Doyle. They're business people up in Minneapolis. And I got this word for Dennis. And, man, to me, it was a big word. I mean, it was like a life-changing, potentially life-changing word for him. So I said, Dennis, I've got a word for you. He said, yeah, give it to me, brother. What is it? I said, just, just hold on here a minute. I didn't know him very well at that time. I said, why don't we wait? We were in kind of a social setting. I said, why don't we meet tomorrow? And we were on a retreat together. I said, let's get sit down, my wife and I, and, and you and your wife, and we'll just, I'll give you this whole word. You could take notes, and we'll tape it or whatever. Okay, good. So he goes to his wife that night, and he says, hey, Rich has a word for me, and I know what it is. She said, oh, you do? What is it? She says, he's going to tell me it's time to sell the business and go into ministry. She said, uh, no. No, it won't be that. It'll be just the opposite of that. Now, how many of you know your wife and the Holy Spirit sound a lot alike? <laughs> Was somebody talking earlier about listening to the wife? <laughs> oh, I tell you, my wife has insight. She, I say, honey, you don't know this situation, but, you know, she knows the answer. She doesn't have to know the situation to know the answer. Your wife may not know your business, but she still knows the answer. So Megan said to Dennis, no, that's not it. So we sit down the next morning, and Dennis says, okay, what's the word? And I said, well, the Lord says you're thinking about selling your business to go into ministry. But God says, no, you're to instead begin to see that your business is your ministry. 
And if you'll do that, you'll start pastoring the business, number one. And number two, God will raise you up as a CEO to minister to other CEOs around the world. That was the word that the Lord had given to me, which I thought was going to be a strong word because I felt he's thinking about selling his business. And when I tell him, no, you can't do it, he's going to be upset. But his wife knew the same thing. Hallelujah. But the last part of that was, if you'll begin to see that your business is your ministry, God will let you be pastor. I said, how many employees do you have, Dennis? He said, 550. I said, you got 550 employees. Most of them are married. That's 1,100. A lot of them have kids. You got 1,500. You got 2,000 people. I said, Dennis, you got one of the largest congregations in Minneapolis. That God has given you authority and oversight as a pastor over those people. He said, but they're not all Christians. I said, you don't just pastor Christians. You pastor. You pastor the flock. Some of them have already come in the fold and some of them haven't, but that's what you're called to do. Now, Dennis began to see this, and Dennis and Megan right away hired an intercessor for their business. They, they disguised her as the receptionist and set her at the front desk. So that everybody that comes in gets prayed for on the way in. Everybody that calls in gets a prayer as they come in. See, all you got to do is disguise your employees very carefully. I, I mean, you're disguised too, right? Amen? You're just disguised. A lot of people think you're an engineer, but you're really an evangelist. So you understand this. But the second thing that happened was that Dennis and I and, and, a, and a few others, Mike and Cindy Jacobs, Wilma and I and Dennis and Megan, Mike and Cindy Jacobs and Paul and Joyce Tan, formed a group called the Nehemiah Partners, which has now got us raised this up to speak to other CEOs. And Dennis has a word to CEOs around America right now. He's remained a, a, a member of the, the YPO, the Young Presidents Organization, where he meets with the, the non-Christians, but he's got a voice to them because he has a powerful message and they all want to hear it. It's this big PowerPoint presentation with 150 slides called The Wealth and Poverty of Nations. And he can give it in a Christian setting or in a non-Christian setting. And God allows him now to minister to CEOs, just like that word said. But I still didn't have a clue then what God was speaking to me. Because that was 1996, and I still didn't have a clue that business was really ministry, although I said it to him. God was still breaking the paradigm of this pastor's mind to get me to the place where I could see how powerful the force is that he wants to release into the world and that he plans to release into the world then, and that he will if we'll let him. So let me just run through this quickly about what is our purpose. Our purpose is to bring about a change in the spiritual climate over the cities and nations in which we live. That's really why we're here, to bring about a change in the climate. I was talking the other night about the culture change, the climate change, that when we come in with the kingdom of God in us, we must change it. Everybody talks about the weather. Why can't we get them talking about the spiritual climate? Why can't we raise that spiritual climate to that level? And our second purpose, I think, is to release, empower, and equip the marketplace leaders as God speaks, which is what we're endeavoring to do at this conference. Tonight, we want to anoint you. There is an anointing that God gives you. We want to assure you have it. We're going to pray for you and, and make sure you walk out of here that way. So we're releasing and empowering with a little bit of equipping. But grab some of the books. Grab my book, God at Work. Grab Ed, Ed's book and the other books that are there. And, and get, get going on some of the equipping that is available to you. Find out about a Kingdom Advice Center coming to a city near you. <laughs> Uh, right, right now, it's just a friend of mine from London who had this idea originally named Richard Fleming and I who are doing these things. So we got anybody here from England? You know, in Guilford and in St. Albans. Any of you know Richard Fleming? Have you, have you heard of this guy? You go to the Kingdom Advice Center in Guilford. This is where it all started. As far as I know, the, this, this whole thing that God has got me caught up in started where these people are in Guilford with the Kingdom Advice Center. Hey, would you, would you give testimony just by saying yes or no that this is a good thing? Yes. Yes, yes it's great. She says it's great. He's, yeah. The Kingdom Advice Center has the potential literally to change the way you think about your business. Hallelujah. So there's one in, a couple of them in London, and Richard's got one going in uh, Holland, and we're starting one in Dusseldorf, Germany. 
Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, and a few cities throughout America to, to equip the people of God to get out doing it. When I saw the Kingdom Advice Center in Guilford, I was thrilled, but I thought to myself, this thing demands Richard to lead it. It's not reproducible. I mean, this guy is so anointed and so good and, and so gifted for this, I thought, this is great, but nobody else can do it. Then I went to London, and we went to St. Albans, and they released uh, Diane Ladd to lead that one over there, and I said, wow, because she's not at all like Richard. She doesn't have the giftings he has, and yet the Kingdom Advice Center was just as powerful. I said, well, this is good. This is reproducible. Then we started doing it in San Jose, and I trained up this young man. We now operate two of them in San Jose. Now we're, we're training it in other places just to equip the people of God. So this is really what God is saying to us. Now today's situation is that even though we see pockets of revival, thank God for one here in Pensacola and a few other places, even though we see these pockets, our cities and our nations remain virtually unchanged. When I started pastoring, 39 years ago, they told me at that time that while one out of two marriages in America end in divorce, one out of 50 where the couples go to church together. I mean, it was a no-brainer. Get Jesus, save your marriage. Promise Keepers came out with a video two years ago that said the divorce rate amongst Christians is now higher than amongst non-Christians. You know what? I looked at that and I said, wait a minute, that happened on my watch. That happened during the 35 years that I pastored. That, during the, that, that happened during the years that I said to a couple, I won't marry you lest we do counseling in advance and walk you through four months of training for your marriage. That happened during the time that I was trying to elevate marriage to the place where I believe God wanted it to be. And yet at the same time in the body of Christ, marriage was not making it. So I say, even though we see these pockets of revival, which I praise God for, my city has not been changed. I dare say maybe yours needs some changing too. Which means that the church as we know it must change the way that it approaches ministry programs. It must change the way it approaches equipping the saints. And it must change the way that we recognize the leadership that God is raising up for today. We've got to change some things, folks. If we just keep doing the same things in the same way and expecting different results, that is the definition of what? So we've got to change, 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 and we've got to change quickly. How do we get there? We divided our lives and our thinking into two separate areas, spiritual and secular. I mean, this happened a long time ago, folks, but we bought it, and we bought it in the church so that we, we have allowed this divided thinking, this, this double-mindedness to come into our lives. And I'm going to prove to you in a minute that you still have that thinking even though you don't want to. And, the, and you, you think it's gone, I'm going to show you that in many cases it's still there. You see, these two views represent the different thinking between the Hebrew or the biblical mindset and the, the Greek or the secular mindset. That there are two world views. One is coming from the Hebrew mind. One is coming from the Greek mind, where Plato came in and, and taught this whole thing. So in the Hebrew worldview, this is a quote from James Thwaites, a great a great book called The Church Beyond the Congregation. There's one of those books where you know what it's all about from just the title. The Church Beyond the Congregation. He's an, he's an Australian. He published the book in Great Britain. And he says to me, Rich, Americans won't read this book because I didn't write it for Americans. Which means it's a little harder reading than some of us are willing to pay the price to get through. But it's fascinating stuff. I like to quote James Thwaites. I was quoting him throughout Australia. And one of his friends came to me and said, he said, praise God for telling me what James was saying. He said, he's one of my best friends, but I never understood him. Well, James is a deep thinker, but listen to what he says here. For the Hebrew, the spiritual or the unseen realm was one with the created realm. It did not exist in a separate or removed dimension. It was in union with all of life in creation. The spiritual dimension of life is the heart or essence of every created thing, both seen and unseen. Let me ask you, how many of you believe in angels? Can you see them right now? Some of you maybe can. Are they here? All right. How many of you believe in demons? Can you see them right now? Maybe some of you can. But are they here? I oh, know they all got ran out during praise. Don't worry about the demons. But you know what I'm talking about, that there are these unseen 
forces that are at work on our behalf or against us. We need to begin to, to grab a hold of the spiritual realm and see that that's the real realm. That the, that the angels are as real as the pulpit. That the, that the reality of the angels is as strong as the glass of water. That the power of the angel is as strong as my hand laying on your forehead. We need to begin to, to move into the understanding that the unseen and the seen are both a part of my reality. Because until I do that, I will keep operating that church is a spiritual and work is a secular experience. We need to get ourselves where we've integrated our thinking. In the Greek worldview, the Greeks saw the spiritual realm disconnected from and separate to the material and relational world. So many people today, most of us, at some part of our life, operate with the Greek worldview, separating spiritual from secular. In this view, work and church don't mix. In this view, you've got to be careful what you say at work, but you can be free what you say at church. See, in this view, you lay down some of your standards when you go to work because, after all, I've got to make a living, and you pick them up when you walk into church and say, you know, here I'm a Christian. Out there I'm a Christian, but nobody knows it, so I don't have to be full of character and wisdom and integrity. When you get your lives integrated, you will be no different at work than you are at church. You will have no different standards at work and church. In fact, you will talk with the same enthusiasm for the things of God at work as you do at church. You will praise God at work like you do at church. I heard this quote. We were Actually, we were having this business meeting, and we're all sitting around as a Christian, Christian business. <laughs> I, I got to think about. I got to rethink putting this quote in here because this company was a startup company in the Silicon Valley uh, three years ago. My book came out in the year 2000, August of 2000. The the founder president of this company got a hold of my book and loved it. Now at that time in the Silicon Valley where I live, startup startup companies were happening every day and people were pouring millions of dollars into these things and hoping that they would all become millionaires well this guy had one of those businesses he asked me to come down and meet him the day I got there another group showed up called the SEC the Securities Exchange Commission they came the same day that I did when I got there they were emptying his files and his computers and taking it because he had been raising money in a way that was not favorable to the SEC but a lot of my friends had invested in the company. And so I, I knew they were there, and I talked to the guy, and his heart was pure, and it seemed like his, his uh, product was good, but he had made some mistakes. I said, what can we do? Well, we've got to get somebody to buy this company. So I hung around there, quote, as the pastor of the company. So later on, when they finally closed him down and threw him in jail, and he's now serving a 14-year term, one of the investors brought a lawsuit and named everybody he could think of, including me. And we had an early evaluation the other day, one of those early evaluations where you're supposed to throw out those that don't belong, which is me. <laughs> That's what I'm thinking. Because this guy's quoting me as saying things I've never said. He says he's got me on video in meetings I've never been to. So we're there, and I said, Judge, I met this guy who's bringing the suit, but I never said what he said. I was never in the meetings, and he turned to me and said, You'd ought to be in prison right along with him. You're just as guilty as him. You said this, this, and this, and I've got you on video. And I said, Then show the video, because I wasn't even at the meeting. The judge said, Mr. Marshall, you're going to trial. I walked out and said, God, I thought you were going to vindicate me. What's going on? He said, Rich, it's not about you. It's about him. I said, what do you mean? He said, it's about that Muslim guy that's bringing that lawsuit against you. Don't you understand? It's not about you. I can take care of you. It's about him. He's the one I'm after. I said, okay, Jesus, give me. Man, so when you were talking today about blessing and, oh, man, I tell you, I was sitting there amening, shouting hallelujah, repenting and everything else as you were going through it because in a much smaller scale, a different scale, I'm walking through the same thing. But it was in this company that we were sitting around talking church at business amen one of the guys said you people need to remember that you can't mix business and church wait a minute I'm not mixing them they're the same thing I am the church wherever I am I don't have to mix business and church I am the church so the current problem is that most of the 
Most of today's world is playing into the split mindset. You and I are. Because we use terms. Let me just ask you if you've ever used this phrase, come to church. Anybody ever said to a friend, come to church? What did you mean by that? You meant come to this building to a service that meets on a certain day at a certain time. But how many of you know that this building is not really the church, huh? How many of you know that we are the church, the, the body, that we are the church, not the building? Did you know that? And yet we still say come to church because we, even though when, well, you know, I, I know better. I, when I say come to church, what I really mean is, but as soon as we say it, we've played into the split mindset to the non-believer who says, oh, I understand church is not something you are. It's a place you go. It's not something you are. It's a building that you attend. It's not something you are. It's a place that has a group of people that have a pastor that do this, this, and this. That's the church. It's separate from my life. When we get out of that split mindset, we'll understand that when we go to work, we are the church. So that when the, the, when the planes hit the World Trade Center, I believe there were evangelists on the 90th floor that God had planted there and they were leading those people to Jesus because the church was there. The church is everywhere that God needs it to be. But if we lay our church stuff down and, and walk out there into the world, the place where you're needed the most won't have you. How about this one? Where do you go to church? Find your, this is one of my favorites, find your place of service in our church. We used to put a big banner up in front of our church that said, every member a minister. We didn't mean you were ministered at your work. We, meant we wanted all of you to be involved in our church. <laughs> I thought I was being really innovative. Every member a minister. Now I say every member a minister, but what I really mean is you are a minister where you are. So start functioning out there in that place. By the way, pastors, don't get worried that all of your business people will stop coming to church. They need you now more than they needed you before. Because now they're out on the front lines in battle. They need somebody to equip them. Don't worry that they'll quit. If you equip them, they'll come. Don't worry that they'll quit giving their tithes. They'll give you more tithes. Don't worry that your ministry programs won't get staffed. They're going to bring all of their friends. You're going to have a much larger pool to choose your workers from. Everything about your church can change. We just change the way we think. So where's your church located? There's another good one. How many people attend your church? How big is your church? I love this one. I have a lot of fun with how big is your church. People say, how big is your church? I said, oh, it's growing. They said, praise God. I said, no, actually, I ate cheesecake last night and gained five pounds. My church is growing. I say, how's your church doing? I said, well, it's getting smaller. They said, oh, I'm sorry. No, no, it's good. I'm on a diet. I mean, I, <laughs> I mean I'm the church, right? Come on, you're the church, we're the church, and we don't have to be here to be the church. I was the church on Continental Airlines when I flew in here. I'll be the church on Continental and American both tomorrow. <laughs> so how big is your church? Well, it's bigger than it used to be because we're growing, folks. With the Greek mindset, the building equals the church, membership equals the church, the church is someplace you go instead of something that you are. My recommendation is that we need to change our mindset and use some phrases like these. Go into the world. It's a good biblical term. You are in full-time ministry. Be the church. Find ministry where you are. Serve God 24-7. Get involved in your own sphere of influence. Instead of getting involved in my church, why don't you get involved in your own sphere of influence and let ministry begin to happen there. Hallelujah. The church is not something, this is another James Thwaites quote, the church is not something separate from marriage, family, and work. Indeed, the church is the people of God living and impacting in and through all of creation. God did not create a special separate thing and call it the church. Instead, he created a body, the head of which is Christ which would encompass and become the completion of created order. I am a part of a body, the head of which is Jesus Christ, and wherever I go, the body of Christ goes. Amen. Amen. Oh, that we could change our thinking to begin to integrate our lives. I don't have time to run through this, and so I'm just going to put them up here, but just to tell you that when God talks about all things in Scripture, it includes all things. So it includes your work. It includes your family. It includes your recreation. You need to let God begin to work in every area of your life. In Ephesians, it says, grow up in all things. In Mark, he says, Elijah restores all things. Jesus, it says of Jesus that he can't return until the restoration of all things. I'm going to tell you something, folks. My end time eschatology, my whole theology of the end things has changed to this. Before Jesus comes, there's going to be a big nation worldwide revival. 
And if that's going to happen, we've got to get a lot of us involved in it. So before it happens, God is going to restore the rightful place of work. He's going to restore you to your kingly anointing. And that's what I really believe is just about to happen, that God is going to do that as we watch this thing. So I say, what's the point? There's a little point in having strong congregations if marriages are falling apart all around us. It doesn't matter if our worship service is contemporary, if people have no strength or time to nurture their own families. So what if the preaching is good, funny, or brief, if the day-to-day -day work of the saints is ineffective? The real battle and place of standing in life and in the heavenly realms is in marriage, in family, and in work. I mean, if we can't make our Christianity work in our marriage and in our family and at our workplace, and our Christianity only, only works when we come to the building where we worship, and this is the only place we can lift our hands, this is the only place we can praise, this is the only place we can hear from God, this is the only place we can get insight, then we're not going to impact our world. We need hallelujah, to get the word out where everyone can receive it. Thank you, Lord. Just open your Bibles with me. I just, I don't have time for everything I've got up here. Open your Bibles with me to Exodus chapter 31. Exodus chapter 31. I say I don't have time. I don't even know what time I was supposed to quit. Maybe I'm already supposed to be done. But you paid the price to be here. Let's get the full meal, huh? Amen. Exodus chapter 31. By the way, just consider missing lunch today, the first day of your fast. That, that Tamar was leading us into yesterday. Amen. Exodus chapter 31. I was sitting in a service listening to a sermon, and God spoke to me, very clearly said to me, Rich, I want you to go home and read Exodus, Genesis and Exodus. <laughs> and I... I should know better, but I very stupidly said, well, Lord, I've already read Genesis and Exodus. <laughs> At which point he said, read it again. Today, I said, okay, Lord, what am I looking for? He said, I want you to, I want you to find my Holy Spirit in Genesis and Exodus. You know, you don't have to read far in the Bible to find the Holy Spirit. Genesis chapter 1, verse 2 says, the earth was without form and void. Darkness covered the earth, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. I said, wow, I, you start reading the Bible, look for the Holy Spirit. He shows up in verse number two, the, where the Holy Spirit is hovering. By the way, I just spend a moment there, even though I didn't have you turn there, to remind you that what he hovered over was void, empty, dark. He, he hovered over nothing in verse three he created. Some of you are at this business conference thinking I don't even know why I'm here. There are creative people here. There are brilliant people here. There are CEOs here. There's rich people here. What am I doing here? I don't have an idea. I don't even know what I'm supposed to be doing. I don't even have a job. What am I here for? I'm just empty, void, and dark. Hallelujah. Because you're the one the Holy Spirit can hover over. I mean, Holy Spirit's having a good time hovering over you right now. See, Holy Spirit is hovering over your emptiness, your darkness, your nothingness, because out of that, He creates. That's why he told me I wake you at 3 in the morning instead of talking to you at 3 in the afternoon because I don't want it when you can offer to me. I want it when I've got you empty. So today, if you're feeling just a little out of place, understand Holy Spirit's right here hovering. <laughs> Thank you for the hovering Holy Spirit. If you think of hovering, you've got to think of wind. If you think of hovering, you've got to think of some some action of the wind that starts blowing and then moving. If you think of a hovercraft, you think of a, a turbine that's strong enough to blow down on the water and lift the boat off and send it where it wants to go. Let me tell you, the Holy Spirit is coming upon you now, blowing down upon you, lifting you up, and sending you where he wants you to go. That's what the hovering Holy Spirit is about to do with your life. I can, I can just tell you right now that the Holy Spirit wants to take you from right where you are to where he wants you to be, and your journey begins now so look here in Exodus chapter 31 I just kept reading through the uh, Genesis and Exodus and I came across this passage about one of my favorite Bible characters how many of you know the story of Bezalel raise your hand oh good in this crowd we got a handful that do we got most of you that don't I want to introduce you to him he's my best friend Whew. say his name just say it out loud Bezalel You've got to kind of get his name on your lips because God is going to do something through Bezalel in our lives this morning. 
Watch this, Exodus chapter 31. The Lord spoke to Moses saying, See, I have called by name Bezalel. By the way, when it says God called by name Bezalel, it doesn't mean that God figured out what his name was. When God calls something, it literally means God gave him the name. God named him. God changed him for whoever he was to Bezalel, which means under the shadow or under the protection of God. When God calls something, he means he puts his sovereignty over it. When it says he saw the, the light, he called it day. That means God put his sovereignty over the day. He saw the dark, he called it night. It means he put his sovereignty over that night. When God calls you, it means he puts his sovereignty over your life. That's why it's so important that we all understand we're all called. Thank you, God. Larry, you said it so well today. It's, I, I never received a call to preach, but I had a silent call. But your call is a strong call. And that's why you can walk in it because he put your sovereignty over you when he called you. So he called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur of the tribe of Judah. Watch this, verse 3. And I filled him with the Spirit of God. That's the first reference in the Bible to someone being filled with the Spirit. I started reading Genesis 1 right up to here. I know that to be the case. Never before do you see it. Joseph, it said in Je Genesis 41, it said he had the Spirit of God in him, and they could see it. But the first one that's referred to as being filled with the Spirit is right here, Exodus 31, verse 3. I have filled him with the Spirit of God in wisdom, understanding, and knowledge, and in all manner of workmanship. Let me tell you something, folks. The first time that the Bible talks about being filled with the Spirit doesn't say anything about speaking with tongues. It doesn't say anything about preaching, doesn't say anything about prophecy, it doesn't say anything about singing, doesn't say anything about worship. The first time that God says, I filled him with my spirit, wisdom, understanding, knowledge, and work. The first time that God filled someone with a spirit, sister, was for their work. It was for the work. That's why I can tell you with assurance today, you are anointed for your work. Because in God's economy, the first filling had to do with work. Later on, we get the rest. But i tell you something. If I understand theological rules and Bible study methods, the law of first mention says this. The first time God says it, man, study that one close because God is establishing foundational principles there. So the first time he says, filled with the Spirit. You see, depending on your theology, filled with the Spirit means a lot of different things. I mean, if you're a Baptist, filled with the Spirit means soul-winning power. If you're a Pentecostal, it means speaking with tongues. But if you're a Bible-believing business person, it means your work. Amen? You're filled with the Spirit. It has nothing to do with all the other stuff we theologians have tended to put up on it. But instead, God says, I'm going to give you wisdom, understanding, and knowledge, and it's for your work. Verse 3. Some of your Bibles say crafts or craftsmanship. Look down to verse 5. It'll say workmanship. Because God says, I'm doing it for your work. Bezalel was filled with the Spirit of God for his work. Anybody know what his work was? Who? I'm getting to that in just a minute. But look at verse 4. It says he gave him. What's it say in verse 4? Read it for me, Richard. To make artistic designs for work in gold, silver, and bronze. Okay, to make artistic designs. I'll tell you what, God is reinstituting the creativity that he put in his people at the beginning in this society. He's reinstituting creative ideas. He's reinstituting witty inventions. He's reinstituting your ability to design new things. The design anointing is coming back into the body of Christ. And I tell you, you know it because many of you are in design work of some kind. Raise your hand if some, your work has something to do with design. Look at this. Throughout here today, design is a part of who you are. And if we had time this morning, you'd tell me we got web designers, we got financial planners, we've got architects, we've got dentists who are designing smiles, we've got pastors who are designing new wineskins for the church, we've got hair designers, we've got software designers. God is saying today is the day to design financial plans for the future and to get you to walk into it. And somehow or another, if we can grab a hold of the fact that that's what the Spirit wants to do. Yes. Man, if you get this, you, you can understand, whoa, I'm not second-class citizen. In fact, I'm at the top tier here. I'm right where God wants me to be. 
I don't have to wait. He filled me. His spirit filled me. Now watch this. I, I tell you, I'm just about to land on something that's going to help you. Now this much, what I preached to you, I put in my book, God at Work. The next thing that I'm going to give you, I didn't see until after I published the book. It's a problem with publishing a book. You get revelation the day after it's printed. I don't know why I didn't see it earlier. It's because I needed a friend to help me. I needed to preach it and have a guy come to me and say, did hey, you think about this? John Peterson's my friend, lives up in Kansas City. Works out of, what, what do they call that church now? Where Floyd, Floyd McClung's now the pastor. Mike Bickle used to be out of that church. Metro. Metro is not Vineyard anymore. Metro something, yeah. But you know, you know, you know what I mean. Okay, John Peterson works. He's rich. Have you thought about this? Watch this, folks. See Bezalel. Here he is, verse verse two. It's Bezalel. God says, "I fill him with the Spirit to design artistic works, to work in silver, gold, and bronze, in cutting jewels for setting." Any jewelers here? Anybody likes jewelry? Go share this verse with your jeweler. Go to your favorite jeweler and say, did you know you're in the Bible? Here you are. God has filled you with the Spirit for cutting jewels and for setting and, and in carving wood. We've got any carpenters here, any big contractors here? Yes, how do you know there's anointing for this stuff? I mean, you, 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 you people just thought, well, that just came natural to me. No, God filled you with that ability. And then he adds, in all manner of workmanship. And indeed, I have appointed him with a holy app because the destiny belongs in the hands of two or more. My destiny is with you. Yours is with me. The kings and the priests together, we can't do it alone. Okay, now what did Bezalel do? Somebody just help me with this. What did he do? What was his task in the kingdom? Come on, what did he build? He built the tabernacle. Come on. What else did he build? He built the ark. Go with me back to Genesis, or pardon me, to Exodus chapter 25. Just turn a couple pages back. Bezalel is the man that built the ark. He put his hands to build the ark. Man, the ark is so significant today that Hollywood is still looking for it. I'm going to talk to Matt about a, another movie here. Raiders of the Found Ark. <laughs> Look at it, Exodus chapter 25, verse 10. They shall make an ark. Now, God is talking to Moses, giving him specific design, but Moses doesn't design it. He calls in, I mean, Moses doesn't build it. He calls in Bezalel, the designer, the builder, the spirit-filled worker. They shall make an ark. God tells them exactly how to look. Look down to verse 20, 22, Exodus 25. And I will meet with you. He says, and there I will meet with you. The ark, I, I made a mis misstatement one time. I said it was symbolic of the presence of God. It wasn't symbolic. It was the presence of God. The ark was the presence. The Lord says, there I will meet with you. I will speak to you from above the mercy seat. The, the ark, the reason Bezalel was filled with the Spirit was so he could build the ark, which was the presence of God. Why does God fill you with his Spirit today for your work? To build an ark. In other words, God, the reason God fills you with the Spirit is so that at your place of work, you build an ark yes. where the presence of God dwells. Yes. You say, what, 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 do I do? What, what do I do when I go to work? I mean, what, what part can I play? I, I'm not the owner. I'm, I'm not the most brilliant one there. No, you just build an ark there. You just build a place there where the presence of God dwells. You just build that at your desk and so that when you sit in that chair, that's God's chair. And when people sit across from you, they're in the presence of God. So they come in, problems, trouble, whatever it might be. Hallelujah. Larry, I identified with you. I was 35 years a pastor, dealt with marriage problems that whole time. 
I know how tiring that could be. I know how painful it can be to watch these people going through the hurt and the pain. But if we could just get them into the presence of God. That's why my wife said, I, I can't remember exactly how she said it, being occupies a place. Occupying a position. All, all you have to do, listen to me, kings in the kingdom, your job is to receive the filling of the Holy Spirit in order to build an ark in your workplace. I preached this to a taxi cab driver in La Plata, Argentina. He said, what can I do? I said, you're the king of your taxi, brother. He said, yeah, but, but what's, I said, it means it's your ministry. It means God's presence dwells there. I'm going to pray for you. I mean, he was driving me to the service where I was going. I was praying for him when he picked me up just before we went, and he fell out in the spirit, and I thought, I'm going to be late to my meeting. <laughs> but in Argentina, it doesn't really matter. <laughs> Doesn't matter what time you get there, they're going to keep going no matter what. Amen. So he's out in the spirit. He comes up. He says, okay, my taxi is my pulpit. I was back to Argentina. That was in July. I was back in November. He came running to me. I said, what's going on? He said, you remember the day you prayed for me? Of course I remember. He said, I've led someone to Christ every single day in my taxi since that day. All he had to understand was that that taxi was his pulpit and he put the presence of God there so that when somebody got in the taxi, it wasn't hard work. It was just letting God do his work. And then he opened the door. Hey, look at this, design. So I'm talking about design. You got it written on your shirt. Faith Designs, a professional printing company. I'm telling you, design is in the names of more businesses now than any other word, designs. And you just proved it to me. Thank you, brother. Glad you wore that shirt today. Everybody go to the professional printing company. They design good work for you. Here's what happened with the taxi cab driver. He realized the pulpit and the taxi were the same. He started leading people to Christ. That you could do this thing. Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I'll draw them into myself. You say, but I'm not an evangelist. I, I don't have that kind of courage. Oh, yeah, but you got God with you, see? What you're doing is building a presence. You're building a place. You're building an atmosphere. You're changing the culture. You're changing the whole atmosphere. It starts with you in your office, your cubicle, your counter, your car, your lawnmower. Starts with you. And then it spreads from there. And if we can get the people of God to stop thinking separate lives, and start thinking, I'm a spiritual being, so I'm spirit at church, I'm spirit at work. And that meaning then, God filled me with his spirit. What for? Why did he fill me? For my work. Why did he fill me for my work? What's it all about? Building, a, building an ark. I'm not talking about a wooden ark, folks. I'm talking about a presence. I'm talking about a place where God dwells. We need to put him everywhere. He needs to be throughout every city. He needs to be throughout every business. Walk that place. Pray the presence of God in there. Pray it in. Lay hands. Go in early. Lay hands on every chair. Come on. You see, if, if we'll do this, you say, what, what, what am I doing? I'm just, no, you're not just doing. You are activating the spirit filling that is in you that allows you to function with dominion like God wants you to have. I've got to tell you one story. I've hesitated on this story because I know that when stories are told and they're not 100% accurate, if somebody knows the story... They think you're, you're phony all the way through. But I heard this story from four different pastors. But I realized as I was getting ready to tell it that the first pastor that told the story was from Pensacola. And so the young man I'm going to talk about grew up in this city. I only know him by his first name, Henry. I don't know his last name. But here's the story that I heard from, from his pastor here, his pastor in Wilmington, North Carolina, his pastor in Mobile, and his pastor in another city. The four pastors were together, and they said, we remember Henry when he was 18 years old here in Pensacola. He got a job at Walmart, and his first job was working in the sporting goods department, and his first job was dipping goldfish, selling them. But he knew he was a Christian. He knew that work was his ministry, so he'd go in and walk around that area and pray for it every day. His little department, asking God to bless there. Pretty soon... His pastor said, we're starting a new church in North Carolina. We need some people to go. 
And uh, he said, I'll go. I'll get a job at Walmart up there. So he went to Wilmington, got a job, started working in the sporting goods department, became manager of the sporting goods department, walked around it, became assistant manager of the store. Hallelujah. All he's doing is just praying. His boss came to him and said, Henry, we want you to move to another city for a promotion to be manager. Henry said, nah, no, God brought me here to help plant this church. I can't leave. His boss said, Henry, as long as I'm here, you will never again be promoted. Three months later, that boss was moved on. <laughs> he told the truth. He said, as long as I'm here, you won't be promoted. When he was moved on, Henry became the manager. Amen. Now he's walking around the whole store, praying for all the employees, praying for every customer that comes in, praying for God's presence and blessing to be there. Then he got a call, Mobile, Alabama, Super Walmart. Would you come and be the manager of the Super Walmart? Now he's got a bigger one. He's praying around it. I try to make the story just impactful but short. One day he gets a call from Bentonville, Arkansas. Anybody know where that is? It's a significant city in Walmart. Home office of Walmart. Pastor says, I took him to the airport that day. Pastor, now the third pastor's moved in and is telling the story. Third pastor says, in our church, he became deeply involved in our congregation. Our family, our church loved him and his family. By now, he's married, got some kids. He started at 18. He's now about 30 years old. He's an integral part of our church. Pastor says, I took him to the airport because Walmart's coming to pick him up. He says, we're standing there watching the planes land. In comes a Cessna 172. Henry says, wonder if that one's for me. Pretty soon, the most beautiful Learjet he'd ever seen landed. He said, oh, that won't be for me. Sure enough. Sure enough, they came to pick him up in this jet. Oh, man, Henry's feeling so good. He gets in the jet. He goes up. Yeah, he gets hired. He's now at headquarters working there, making a lot of money. His pastor said, when we did the going away service for him at our church in Mobile, I preached the sermon, and it was, this was the title of it. If you won't dip the goldfish, you can't fly the Learjet. <laughs> I don't know where you are today, folks, but if you won't dip the goldfish, you can't fly the Learjet. <laughs> if you won't be Jesus where you are today, don't expect that he's going to promote you to be Jesus where you want to be. you just got to understand today is the day. Hallelujah. Would you stand to your feet with me right now? Thank you, Lord. Oh, Father, tonight we're going to have an anointing service. Can you come back tonight? You don't want to miss tonight. You don't want to miss what's going to happen in the form of impartation because the impartation of the Holy Spirit, good to see you, brother. The impartation of the Holy Spirit is what can change, literally change your life. And tonight we're going to let that Holy Spirit impartation flow and release and empower and thank God he's the equipper. Amen. He's the equipper. I read a business principle. I was reading an article about shell oil. I work a lot in Houston now. I just try to get caught up on what's going on there. In Shell Oil, there's a, a say, saying that goes around. It's called TINA, T-I-N-A. And what happened was they were having a, a, a planning meeting, and somebody just started shortening this phrase, there is no alternative to TINA. There is no alternative. And so they started saying around their place, uh, TINA is in the house meaning we've come to a place where there's no alternative. Folks are going to say this morning, Tina is in the house. Tina has come. There's no alternative, folks. If, if we don't pick this up and run with it, there's, well, let's just put it this way. There is no alternative. I, I, you're the ones that have to do this right now. I mean, at your workplace, nobody else is going to do it. It's you. So, Father, today, in the name of Jesus, thank you for the filling of the Spirit. Thank you for the release of the anointing. And thank you that today we've accepted the challenge and said there's no alternative. We walk in in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Give God praise, would you? Hallelujah. What a powerful word from God today. What a way to end this Saturday. Amen. And now tonight at 7 p.m., remember, here's the grand finale. We have... A king and a priest together tonight that will share. Mr. David Green is living everything you just heard today. And he will share with you from a kingly perspective. And then Pastor Kilpatrick from a priestly one. God bless you. We'll see you back here at 7 p.m.